Honestly, the dinner. Woo! I'm going to turn it down and hang on. <laughs> if I could just hear that good boy, I could. <laughs> Get rid of this kidney stone without too much more trouble. 
Shannon, you're going to have to pray for this guy. <clears throat> Shannon's liver and kidney stones. You're going to have to pray for Charles. <laughs> got to go lay off two weeks and go back and have surgery again. Oh, so they're trying to... Well, they got to put a stent in me. And then they got to go back and try to get the stone. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. My goodness. All right. Anyone else? Jimbo's having a colonoscopy in the morning. He's freaking out. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> He's sitting on the couch with a sad face. <laughs> I hate to laugh. I, I got one coming up sometime. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's like a it's like a horror movie. You know, they, they told me they said you got they said you got to call and do your your pre assessment at the hospital and all this stuff. So they get you lined up to do all that. And and the lady called. I mean, I had an appointment. She called and she went through all these asked me all these questions and everything. And she said, okay. She said, we'll, we'll call you back when it's time to do it. And I said, I, I thought this was the pre-op to get it done. She said, it is. But she said, right now, it's probably going to be sometime in September. And I thought, well, you, I've been stressed. Just let's do this. <laughs> Anywho, we're just praying everything goes good for Jimbo. Yeah, my goodness. That's his heart. <clears throat> Anyone else tonight? All right, Brother Charles, I'm going to ask you if you'll come. We'll lay hands on you tonight, seriously, because I know that the kidney stones are hurtful. And Christine, why don't you come? I'm going to pray for you for your MRI. I don't see any way he's got to pray for Christine here tonight. <clears throat> oh, goodness. Come on, Shannon. I'm going to have Shannon come up and pray because he's... He's a, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, uh, a lot of you have. He was a big, what they call a general in the army, a big preacher. But I read in, in his book, he said that he had seen a lot of people healed of kidney stones in, in his ministry when he prayed, but yet he suffered with them his whole life. But he was able to pray for people and they would get relief. And he said it, it was... It was amazing. So we're just praying that Shannon is going to help you get relief from these kidneys. Go on up here, bro. Serious, serious. Jack, we can sit prayer. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to the
got the hand up on them. So we're going to lead you by faith for them. And we're going to help them through their ordeal, Lord, and touch them and heal them. And we just lift up Amy to you tonight. Because so I realize that's a struggle for her. And so Lord, we just ask you to touch her and that you would heal her for your glory. So now, Lord, as we continue tonight, just Holy Spirit, as always, just have your way among us. And we'll give you the thanks and we'll give you the praise and the glory for everything you did for us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And the saints will say we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Brother Randall, we're going to worship as we give. And Sister Joyce and Sister Mary, we're going to bless us with song. Father, make this a blessing, not a burden. It's a blessing, a little burden. And I have to get it.
we'll get the book of James uh, in the next few weeks. <clears throat> I, I thought about, as Christine had asked maybe to do Galatians, I had thought about maybe continuing on through that. And, but, but I just felt like, you know, when, when you look at Paul's epistles, his letters, uh, there, there's different things in each one of them, but there's a lot of the same things to the churches that he that he covers in each of his epistles. And, and I know I know you wouldn't get bored with that. I know you wouldn't, but I felt like we would we would just move over and, and look at James. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of people don't know a lot about James. In fact, there's not a lot of history about him. But the history that we do have. Uh, that was handed down by, by the church, the early church, and the information that we do have about him. There were some things that the scripture tells us about him in regards to before Christ was crucified and resurrected, James did not believe in him, his brother James. But after he was resurrected, he believed in him and, and became the leader of of the, of the Jerusalem church or the elders. So we're, we're just going to try to look at that tonight. We're just going to do an introduction to the book. We're not going to look at any, any verses tonight. Uh, the next time, which will be August the 9th, because we've got the crusade next week, we'll look at the first eight verses in chapter 1. So to get started, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Pastor Bill if he'll just have an opening prayer for us. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for the privilege that we have to be in church and study your word. God, we thank you for Pastor Mike and all the people here. We just ask, Lord, that your spirit would open our hearts this evening to the word of God. Just touch Brother Mike and anoint him, God, to teach us your uh, will and your word tonight. And we give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, brother. <clears throat> Now, in the introduction, what I want to share with you, you got it on your notes there, but uh, <clears throat> there are at least, at least five men who were named James in the New Testament. Two of them were disciples, and you, you'll find that. I'll put the scriptures in parenthesis so we don't have to turn to them. If you want to, we can. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse verse 2 and 3, we learn that there are two Jameses in, in the group of disciples. One of them is the son of Zebedee, and of course he is a brother to John. <clears throat> you know, Jesus nicknamed him sons of thunder. And the other James is the son of Alphaeus. So both, both Jameses were, were disciples, but it was not either one of them that wrote this epistle uh, according to tradition and history. Now, in Matthew uh, chapter 13, Matthew lists uh, in 13 and verse 55, he lists the name of James and Joseph, Joseph and Simon and Judas, which is actually Jude, which we also have a book by in the Bible, and he lists him as brothers of Jesus. And that's the James that we're, we're focusing on as far as the letter goes. And he was not a believer in Jesus before the crucifixion. James, the brother of Christ, that brother of Christ, John tells us that in his gospel in chapter 7 and verse 5, John said, and his brothers did not believe in him. And you can, you, you can imagine that, couldn't you? Uh, if you grew up with, with a brother, and you know, with siblings, if you, if you had siblings, you, you can imagine that at the age of 30, one of your siblings steps up and says, I am the son of man, I, I am the Messiah. So it would take a lot of convincing, wouldn't it, to, to really just automatically have that faith now, that's why I say I'm so thankful that I'm on this side of the cross. Because all these people had to go through all that doubt for me. <laughs> they, they lived through it all and had proved 
that to, they didn't have to doubt it. But he was a believer until after the resurrection. And Paul tells us that when we study Corinthians in the 15th chapter and verse 7, Paul said, in proving the resurrection of Christ, Paul was listing everybody that had seen him after he was resurrected. And he said, after he had showed himself to the disciples, he also showed himself to James, his brother. And then he was seen by over 500 people at one time. But Paul said he showed himself to James. Now, you think, well, why would that, why would that be important? Because I believe that it was the same James that was his brother who did not believe before the crucifixion, but did believe after the crucifixion, after the res resurrection. Come on in, sis, you're fine. We're, we're just getting underway. <clears throat> you might have uh, Randall's. We got more notes back there. So. Yeah, Randall, give me a note Thank here. Thank you for coming. Yeah, give me a He's going to get you a note. It's, it's kind of informal. You can fill in the blank if you want to. <clears throat> Randall will get that for you. But any, anyhow, in Galatians, uh, in the first chapter in verse 19, Paul actually met James. And he, he's the Lord's brother because he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Now, we studied that in Acts chapter 15. You remember? When Paul had to go up, Paul and Barnabas, they had to go up, and they had to go in front of the elders, they had to go in front. James was the leader of that church. And James the one that had gave him the advice of what he needed to do in order to, to keep the Jews from basically trying to kill him. So there, there's a lot of scriptural records about James. And, of course, when I say the early church, the first century church, uh, the, they all held to the tradition that this James was the brother of Christ. And he is the same one that, that they believe wrote this epistle, this letter. And they base that on the fact that the information that he has in this, in this letter, in this epistle that we have. And we'll see it as we go through that. And, of course, they, they, they deduct the fact of everything that he knows in regards to Christ and everything that he, he makes known about Jesus, that's where they pretty much said it had to be. He had to be his brother because they knew it wasn't, it wasn't the disciple that did it. So early tradition says it was this James that wrote the letter. Now, until late in the 20th century, the book was contested by the Jewish rabbinical council until the late 20th century. And they contested it that it did not belong in what we call the canon, which is the 66 books that we have that, that was chosen at, at the meeting in Nicaea, Council of Nicaea, when they came up and said, well, this, they all said, this is the books that belong in Scripture, and they call it a canon. Those 66 that they all agreed on that were actually Scripture. Well, the Jews did not accept the fact that James should have had a letter in the Christian Bible. And the reason for that was is because he has an association, and we will read it as we go through it, but he makes a, an association between good works and, of course, in the Torah, which is a written book, which was once oral, that the Jews have, the Torah speaks about the good works as James also does. So they made, they made a point of saying, look, Christianity is based on saved by grace alone. We preach that, don't we? When we preach that we're not saved by works, that's what we preach. 
So they say in order for James to say that you must have works to have faith, they, they said that's the Jewish doctrine of the sacrifices of what you have to do in order to find favor with God. So therefore, it is really, it is really against, it contradicts the doctrine of grace, of saved by grace. But it, it went all the way, they contested that until late in the 20th century when they finally came together and saw that it was going to stay in there <laughs> from, from 300 AD all the way up to 2000. They saw that it was going to stay in there, so they haven't, there hasn't been a big contest since then. They haven't taken it out. I'm glad that, that Christian theologians stood behind it. I, I'm glad they didn't give in and say, well, maybe we do need to take another look at that. Well, let me say this to you just, I don't know if it's a commercial. <laughs> I'm not a prophet. But the AI, I, I know you're getting sick of hearing about AI. You hear it from me, and I know you're, you're getting sick. But I'm going to tell you something. Make a note of it. <clears throat> AI is going to write a Bible. It's coming. It's kind of artificial intelligence. Uh, these computers, they're going to put out a version of the Bible by themselves. You just must get ready for it. And once that happens, then you're going to, you're going to start the whole theological debate again about the scriptures that we have. And it's, it's a ploy of the enemy to, to come against this word. That's what it is. Because this is the true word that we have. And Satan has always tried to come against yeah. this word. He, he don't care what I believe. He doesn't care what you believe. But he cares about what this word says. And when you and I believe this word, that's where the root of his problem is. And he's going to come out against that. So that's why it's important to know the scripture. It's important to know them because this technology can can do things in such a way that may cause you to say, hmm, I never thought about it like that. Well, good. <laughs> you shouldn't think about it like that. You should always know <laughs> this is the absolute truth. And, and that's what the church is built upon. So I just want to throw that out there. But it's, it's going to happen. Uh, I don't know when. But it's going to happen. And when it does, you, you know what's going to stem from it. I mean, you're going to have all the debates and everything will start. And, and it's just going to be. And see, as long as, as long as the church is fighting without doctrine, <clears throat> then souls are dying and going to hell. While we're fighting without doctrine instead of preaching the gospel. And and that's that's Satan's ploy. So we're, we're trying to keep away from that. All right, the, it was written, the letter was written sometime between 48 A.D. and 62 A.D. Now, the way they come up with that date is Josephus, you all heard of Josephus, he was a priest and he was a Jewish historian. He didn't write scripture, but he wrote a couple of books, history books. Some of them are, are factual, some of them they say they've been stretched a little bit. But anyway, it wasn't scripture. But he did record the things that happened during the time of Jesus. He mentions Jesus one time in all his writings. And what he says about Jesus is that he claimed that he was the Christ and, and that he had followers. So he said that James, that this James, the brother of Jesus, he records that he was stoned in, in 1962. In A.D. 62, <laughs> he was old, he like that. In A.D. 62, Josephus writes that he, he was stoned at that time. So scholars, which I'm not one, but the scholars say that it was probably written, and that probable is always what it is, a problem but it was probably written after the Jerusalem Council, which happened in 49 A.D. Remember we read about that in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas went up? 
and the council, and Peter was there, and Peter said the, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the Gentiles. Remember that? And, and they said, well, we can't deny that. I mean, if the Holy Spirit has fallen upon them, then God has saved them. We can't deny it. So remember, they put that little letter together, that, that little doctrine that they had that they had sent out to all the churches, and they, what did they tell them in that letter? Remember, we covered that pretty good. Because that was the basic doctrine of the Christian church at the very beginning, as far as rules and do's and don'ts. Remember what, what they told them not to do? There was only three things they told them not to do. One of them was keep from strangled eating Yeah, yeah, don't, don't eat animals with blood still in them. Yeah. yeah, because life is in the blood. So they said, stay away from that. That was the first one. The second one was, stay away from things offered to idols. Don't eat the food that's offered to idols. Uh, the, they, would, they would sacrifice a, a, a bull to their idol, to, to their god, and then they would take the meat and sell it in the market. And <clears throat> so Paul had a good, remember we studied a lot about that. Paul said, if you go in the market by beef, just don't ask them where they got it. Just buy it, eat it, and go on. Because if you know it come from a temple. But what happened was they actually had their own temples, like, like little cafes, that's what I would call it. But when they would sacrifice the animal, they would sell the meat in, in like a restaurant so the people could go there and eat. But the meat is the one had been sacrificed to their idol. And the church had had nothing to do with that because you're participating in that if you do it knowingly. Remember Paul said if, if somebody invites you over for dinner, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and they set a pot roast on the table, don't ask them where they got it at. <laughs> He said, just receive it with thanks because they say, oh, we got it from our Bible <coughs> temple. Then you, know, you can't eat it. You know, you know. So, it, and the whole point is doing it knowingly. But the scholars said they figured, they thought, and they give it a day of 48 just to be on the safe side. So they may have wrote it before the council, but they, they pretty much determined it happened after that meeting, which I would say probably so. I mean, he's the elder of the church in Jerusalem, and they handed down that order of the do's and the don'ts as far as rule goes. Never said anything about doctrine. Never mentioned anything about the resurrection of Christ. They just told them what to do and what not to do. So this letter that James has put in this book, it deals with do's and don'ts and not doctrine. But he ties the doctrine into the do's and the don'ts. So it's just like saying, once they got that, that letter from the council that said, don't eat food offered to idols. Well, why? Well, James just kind of explains that further when he talks about what Christians should do and what Christians should not do. And he explains the reason behind that. So I, I agree with him that in a sense it was probably written sometime after that meeting. Now his audience, the people he was writing to, <clears throat> I always say this and, and I believe it. I don't think that the people that, that wrote the letters, that wrote the scripture, Paul and James and Jude and, and all of them that wrote the, the gospel writers and evangelists, I don't believe they had any idea that they was writing the Bible. Uh, I think they were they were recording what what they thought needed to be recorded, but I don't think they had any idea that they were writing doctrine for the church. But that's what they were doing. That's what they were doing, and the Holy Spirit was guiding them to do that. So when James wrote this. Remember now, the council had handed down the do's and don'ts. And then he writes, his audience, he says in, in the first verse, this letter is to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. He was writing to Jewish Christians because he's a Christian. 
He's, in today's language, he would be called a Messianic Jew. That's what they would call him. He, he was a Jew converted to Christianity. And he's writing this letter primarily to them. And we know what the Jews were hung up on. Paul dealt with it considerably. What did the Jews always have a problem with? Circumcision. Huh? Circumcision. The law. Yeah. The circumcision and keeping the law. They, they were still, well, that's all they knew. I mean, that's what they'd been taught for thousands of years. And it was hard for them just to break away from the law. It was hard for them to, to just say, no, the law didn't mean anything. Jesus didn't say the law was no good. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. That's what he said about it. So the law was good, but the Jews had a problem with the law and Jesus. They, they, they couldn't believe that the Messiah would, would go against the law in some of the areas like eating with unwashed hands. Remember when they had that big thing? When they were eating, the Pharisees said, your disciples eat and they don't wash your hands. That, that was, those, those are the pre, prehistoric people in my family. That's just, I grew up now and I, I probably didn't wash my hands. <laughs> you know, it's just something you don't think about. You don't think. But anyway, they had, they had chided Christ and his disciples for that because they would break the law. And that's why they had a problem accepting Jesus as being the Messiah. He would, he would not do that. Now, the theme of the book, and each book has a, has a theme uh, as to what it's really, what's it about. And the book of James, the theme is patient perseverance. Patient perseverance during trial and temptations. Persevering in patience. <clears throat> Patient perseverance. That's when, when we read it, you'll you'll gather that by some of the things that he says. He even starts off by saying that. <clears throat> Why do you think they would have needed patience and perseverance? Do we need patience and perseverance? God just gave you one reason why we're going to have to have perseverance. When this AI gets turned loose. <clears throat> And, and, and we've got to be we got to be patient in, in knowing that God has this thing. It is not out of his control. And James is trying to tell the first century Christians we, we don't know the half of it. Uh, I mean you can read it but you don't know the half of it. If those, those Christians it was nothing for the Roman government to go in and take everything they own, Charles, because they wouldn't worship Caesar. And, and just, I mean, just obliterate it. Take everything they own. You know, the Pharisees, Jesus said, were guilty. He said, you, you make long prayers and long prayers, but yet you devour widows' houses. If the widows couldn't pay the, the temple tax, the Roman widow paid too much. Remember that? But if she hadn't had two mites to pay for a simple tax, they would have probably took her house because that's what they did. So it was nothing for the Roman government to go in and take everything that Christians had because they were opposing Caesar. They went against the government of that day. So when you, when you think about that in terms, it would have took a lot of perseverance to keep proclaiming Christianity and having to battle that in your everyday life when you think about it. So James says you have to be patient in that perseverance. And patience doesn't mean that you just wait and see what's going to happen. Patience means you know what's going to happen. You're just looking for God to do it on his time schedule. You know that all this evil and everything that's going on and all everything that's happening, you know it's not going to go on forever. You know it's not going to happen forever. 
And you know that God is going to put his foot down at some point. So as far as the patience is, we stay true to this word. We don't give up on this word. We know it's going to be fulfilled. And then his purpose in writing was to encourage his readers, which are us, and the end of that day, to live consistently. He encouraged his readers to live consistently with what they had been taught and what they learned about Christ. What they had been taught and what they had learned about Christ. He, he gets <clears throat> and so, some preachers would say he meddles. He, he meddles. He, he, the only pastor, but he, he gets into the personal life of the individual believer. It, it's not just a generic one size fits all. He, he personalizes this letter <clears throat> to those who claim Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, the born again Christians. That's who he's writing to, the Jews. Now, it wasn't new in James' day to have people that professed it but really weren't Christian. But because something would come up, Jesus told them about that. Remember the parable of the sower? He said, you, you know, in, in the paraphrase, what he's saying, I've come to sow the seed of truth. And, and some of you will, will accept it right off. You know, some of you, but it won't take root in your life. And then when persecution comes, you it'll join them away. Well, that's what James is zeroing in on. Persecution has come, and he is saying that those who are born again in Christ have a responsibility to live consistently for Christ. Now, many knows what the word consistent means. What does it mean to be consistent? I hear it all the time. What is it? Continue on. Continue on. <laughs> Continue on. You're on the right track. Yeah, that's part one. Continue on. To be consistent is to continue on. The right path. Yeah. The right path. The right Stay. path. The right path. Continuing down the right path. Being persistent. Being consistent or persistent. But consistency means that we stay true to this word. We're consistent to it. Yeah. It, it's not happening today, Jack. Yeah. Because I hear it all the time. This word is not relevant. I let it know he preached on that. Yeah. Let him preach that this word is relevant. But you hear that. Well, to be consistent, this word has got to be obeyed all the time. Yeah. Not just some of the time. Not just when it's hitting, but all the time. That's consistency. <clears throat> and he emphasizes, back on your notes, he emphasizes beauty <coughs> over <coughs> doctrine. And what I mean by that is, he emphasizes godly living and not just godly knowledge. <clears throat> I, I heard... I heard an evangelist say one time that there's a lot of people talking about going to heaven, but there's not a lot of people walking towards you. Did that come out right? Yeah. <laughs> Y'all looked at me. Did yeah. I yeah. say that right? <laughs> he said there's a lot of people talking about going to heaven, but there's not a lot of people walking towards you. Isn't, isn't that true? It, it comes back. It goes back to the old Facebook thing I saw a few years ago. It, it always comes around every January. You had to see it way after New Year's. It'll pop up if, you, if you're on Facebook. And it says, I joined the gym, but I'm going to get my money back because <clears throat> I haven't lost a pound. And then it says, under, they never said I had to go. <laughs> well, it, it's, the same, it's the same, believe it or not, it's the same in, in church. And it's the same with religion. 
There are people who believe that they're in a particular church or belong to a particular religion. It's just almost automatic that they're going to, that they're going to be saved. Okay? You know, it, it's it's cultic to some extent, but it's not it's not true. So he emphasizes duty over doctrine. James gets into the what Vernon McGee would, would call where the rubber meets the road. That's what James does in this letter. And in so doing, he analyzes genuine faith. He analyzes genuine faith. Is there, is there another kind? Huh? Faith, faith. Faith, faith. I heard there was a word for it. <laughs> Give me an example of faith. Say, I won't put you on the spot. Yes, I will. Okay. Oh, I'm so rude all the time, but I ain't. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I write that down? I might preach at you. I might preach at you. Look, I'm ready for that. We can use that in a sermon. That's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Faith, faith. That faith is good. Genuine faith. That the sad, the sad thing that, that James analyzes, what he finds out about when we read this book, James is the one that, that he's the one that tells us that when we read these words, it's like looking into a mirror. Remember, I mean, because we're seeing humanity. When you look in the Old Testament, you see humanity at its worst. You see how the degradation started. You see how it's come through to the human race. And when you look at it in the Old Testament, then we really shouldn't be surprised about things we're seeing today. But because that's humanity. And when we look into this word, it shows us things about ourselves. Doesn't it? Uh, when, we, when, we look, when we look at that. So the genuine faith that he is talking about is the faith that is based on this word. It all goes back to this word. That because if, if this is not our doctrine, if this is not what we stand on, if this is not what our faith is grounded in, then it's no good. It, it's not genuine faith. Genuine faith comes from here. And that's what James is trying to get those first century Christians to understand that genuine faith is not fake faith. I, I guess a, a good way to put it would be to say it this way. You can't fake having Christ in your heart. You, you, you may fake other ways. You may fake with personalities. But Jesus told the Pharisees now, when they would walk around in the cities and in the towns and in Jerusalem, I mean, they were fancy. They, they were authoritative. They had the brightest robes. I mean, they wore the big hats like somebody else does in churches today. <laughs> they wore big old hats and walked around. And, you know, they, they looked, they looked. I mean, to look at them, the, these guys are right now. And <clears throat> he said, you're like white washed. Now, they didn't have two sons like we do, but that's pretty enough. But they would whitewash them. They would paint them to kind of make them look better than just a whole rotten tombstone out there. And he told them, he said, you guys are like those whitewashed tombs. I believe he had some of the point at, Charles. Because he said on the outside, go ahead. Sit. Pastor Mike, today if you were in Israel and you saw a Jewish person, you would see if they had a long curl on either side, and they, the curlier those are, the more religious they are. Really? And so they would pin curl it, like if the women remember pin curling with Bible they, 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 they would They pin those curls that's long, they pin them up so they... When they let loose of them and they go out into the streets, they're real curly. So they're curled up. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
they probably, it's probably part of the tradition is, and part of the way they were. And, and Jesus said, if you look at it on the outside, but on the inside, you are full of dead men's bones. And, and he, he wasn't, you and I would take that literally and say, when he's talking about the rotten. Well, yeah, they were rotten, but he was talking about the fact they were dead spiritually. They were dead men walking. I preached a sermon on that one time. Dead men walking. They were dead spiritually. Physically, they looked, they, they had to look. But he told them that. James cuts through the chase. And he narrows it down to the individual. He analyzes when we say we have faith, then he, he more or less is asking the question, do you really have faith? Because if you really have genuine faith, then he lists the things that, that should point to that. He's emphatic about the reality of Christianity. <clears throat> that was the big push. That was the big push. And that's why I put it in parentheses for you again. Because like Paul, James saw the resurrected Jesus. He saw it. He saw him. He knew he was on the cross. He knew he was in the tomb. But he saw him. Jesus made it a point to let him see him. That's why I'm in agreement with the scholars. I think this is the one that wrote it because he writes about the resurrection so emphatically. He pushes it so emphatically that Jesus is alive. And that's the whole point of the Christian gospel is that he's alive. Because if he's alive, he's able to save to the uttermost those who need to be saved. He's alive and he's able to save. But the other side of that is he also knows what's going on when he's alive. We're accountable to a living Savior. And not, not a historical figure. We're not, account, we're, we're not accounted, accountable just to a book. We're accountable to the Word. And Jesus is the Word. Right? So it, it's accountable to Him. And a lot of people have, have a problem with it. That that's just, that it's just a problem they have. That's just how it is. He's alive. And, and James emphasizes that. The reality of Christianity. So he generally states that Christians live a certain way if their faith is genuine. If their faith is genuine and not fake, they live a certain way. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't say anywhere in his, in his letter, we'll, we'll, read, we'll read through all of it, he doesn't say anywhere in there that being Christian is being perfect. He doesn't, he doesn't liken it unto perfection. He takes the human human part of, of humanity and says if you have genuine faith that Jesus is alive and he is in your heart, then this should reflect it. This is what you should have to show for. That's why you hear me preach from here all the time. The same Holy Spirit that tells me that one thing is a sin will also tell you that it's a sin. It, he doesn't pick and choose. It, it, if it's a sin, it's a sin. And so, so you can't say, well, I'm born again, I'm in Christ, but yet you're living a life of sin. Then how can that, how can that be? The, the God, he, won't, he won't accept me that way. How, how's he going to Except you anyway. Now he'll receive us just as we are, don't he? Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think I probably said it a lot of times we say it. Well, Jesus will accept you just like you are. I've changed my view on that. Jesus will receive me just like I am, <clears throat> but he won't accept me just like I am because that's why he died, is to change me into the person he wants me to be. If he accepts me just as I am, 
there, there needs to be a change on my heart. He will receive me in my vilest offense. The vilest offender can be saved. He will receive the vilest offender but he's not going to accept that offender unless they're saved. When he receives, he receives us, then he accepts us. That's why John said, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Not just to those who know him, but you've got to have him in your heart. So James will touch on that. And the personal application, I put it last. Uh, I tried to cut back on these things. See, this applies to me too. You think I'm just telling you that? Because I say a lot of yous, but, uh, but I'm in that you. <laughs> I'm a you you. I'm in there. He urges in the personal application and said, well, what does this book say to me personally? How does it apply to my life as an individual? Well, <clears throat> first of all, he urges spiritual growth in our personal lives. In this letter, he urges his readers, and we're part of them, <clears throat> spiritual growth. Peter has something to say about that. A lot of disciples have something to say. Paul had a lot to say about that. Writer Hebrews had a lot to say about that. We have to grow in Christ. It's something that we have to do. It, it goes back with the consistency. And you, and you learn something new every day, don't we? Mm -hmm. Just as soon as I learned all the answers, the questions changed. <laughs> and they'll continue to change. Because as I get older, I, I have to answer different questions. <laughs> Why does his shoulder hurt when I put my seatbelt on that quick? We used to do that. I used to climb the ladders, now I can't put a seat down at all without getting hurt. <clears throat> well, it's the same spiritually. When Christ comes into your heart, and I sincerely believe he does, that everyone who asks him to do it sincerely, I believe he comes into their heart. But if, but if they stop at that point, if they, don't, if they don't want to know more about him, if they don't want to be more like him, if they don't want to live in that sense, then it's not something that he forces. You know, the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's a real person. He, he's a spirit. Yeah. But he's a real personality, Jack. Yeah. And, and he's alive. Yeah. And he's not just a force to be called upon like Popeye eating spinach. <laughs> it's not something you can just call out here and there. So if we don't grow in him spiritually, how, how many know this? I know the pastor can tell you right up and left. He'd probably jump up and raise his hand. How many knows we, we change spiritually the more we minister and the older we get? The more we learn. The more we understand. Yeah. But we don't progressively change our views just because we're getting older. We are consistent to what it says. So we don't change our views on what the Bible has to say. Progressive Christianity does that. That's a big danger. Because progressive Christianity teaches, well, they didn't have to deal with all the stuff we're having to deal with today. The, the gender confusion, the, you know, the, the transitions, the homosexuality, the AI, the you know, everything that we're dealing with today, well, they didn't have to deal with that back in their day. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Do you know the Iron Age came into existence when David was king? Oh, go back and read that. History. See, the Bible won't speak a whole lot about iron, but all of a sudden they're using tools. They're, they're talking about weaponry. They're, they're, they're talking about shields. They're talking about, well, before the Iron Age, guess what everything was made out of? Yeah, wood or rock or what? But the Iron Age came into existence from China, I think. 
But anyway, it popped up, and they began to use that. So, you know, they think, well, we're going to take this a step further. Uh, how, how many ever read the far side cartoons? <laughs> then you bring it. <laughs> you have to be persistent in your faith to read far side. I like the way that guy's mind works. Yeah. You got a wild mind. Did you see the one about the cavemen? There were three cavemen, and one was sitting on top of a wheel, <laughs> and the other two were getting ready to push it down the hill. <laughs> and they had the guy tied to the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> they were getting ready to push it. And the caption under it said they had to revive some of their transportation techniques. <laughs> I thought that was cute. But no, they could be transported by the wheel, but no, we can't sit on it. <laughs> anyway, it's the same with spiritual growth. It, it has to be, it has to be something we do. We can't just stop <clears throat> in our personal lives. And then <clears throat> Excuse me. I need my head out. Then we are to be sensitive. Here, here's the part. We're to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in our social relationships. What does that mean? James to talk about that. <clears throat> we not only have to grow spiritually in our personal lives, but we have to be sensitive knowing the Holy Spirit when we deal in social relationships. That, that's, not just, that's not just husband and wife. That's, social is society in dealing with relationships. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in our social relationships. Why is that? Well, John said in his letter, <clears throat> the same John that wrote John 3.16, for God so loved the world, John said in his letter, how can we say that we love God whom we have not seen if yet we hate our brother that we do see. Mm -hmm. So if it's social relationships and if we're Christians and we're born again <clears throat> and we interact with people as Jesus lives in our hearts, I understand something. <clears throat> he, he doesn't change our personality. The, the personality that we have, that we were born with, is who we are. It is our character that is affected by the Holy Spirit. Because see, the word character is care, actor, and actor. Someone who follows the script. That's what a character is. So our character is governed by the Holy Spirit. Not our personalities. <clears throat> Some are quiet. Some like me talk all the time. <laughs> Some dance, some sing, some, you know, there, there's different personalities. There, there are people who, who love being in crowds. There are people who don't like to be in crowds. There, there's all different personalities. There's some people that like vanilla ice cream. Some, you know, some like chocolate. And it's just, <clears throat> so there's differences there that's not affected. But the character is where the Holy Spirit Worlds, and that's what we have to be sensitive to yeah. in the social relationships. And just to give you an example, I told you about the guy that came to me at work, <clears throat> and he said, I want to ask you a question. And, and get that a lot. And I said, Okay. And he said, How come, or how can, not come, how can my supervisor go to church on Sunday? and get on the stage and lead worship and come in here on Monday morning and talk to me like a dog and treat me like that. What would you say? What's your answer to that?
I wouldn't have been smart back in the day. I should have said that. And I would have been sensitive. But that's, that's good. That's good. <clears throat> I just simply said, I'll tell you how he does it. He just does it. He does it. I mean, what am I supposed to do? How are you going to define that? Well, he's a different person on Sunday. No, he just does it. He goes up on Sunday and he leads worship and he comes in here and he talks to you like a dog. And that's just who he is. That's how he can do it. But the real question is, is Christ really in his heart if he does it? That, well, that's where it's at. For the rubber hits the ground. Yeah. yeah, you got it right there. And Ruth and I are often asked what our secret is of our age, you know. Yeah. And we tell them that it's our trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Write that down, Christ. Right? Right. Because Ruth, Ruth 98, right? Yeah. And you're catching it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Glenn, Glenn and I were at a pay restaurant, <clears throat> and the kid comes over to us. They want to know what the secret is. And I they tell them, know. we tell them that it, it's our trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. There's this young man at a restaurant was at a waiter. He was Jamaican. Yeah. And he came over, and we were there. And he just, just out of the blue, he said, how long you guys been there? <clears throat> and I said, 44 years, actually. You know, had 44 years. He said, well, I can see the love in your eyes. He said, I, I, I can see that, you know. So my head goes, and notch up. <laughs> and then he says, <clears throat> what's your secret? And I said, sir, it ain't no secret. <laughs> it ain't no secret. So you do it. You just do it. And we went in on that, and she followed up on that. But I thought that was an equally so what's your secret? A secret. Ain't no secret. To it. You just do it. So that's what James is zeroing in on in his letter is the human part, <clears throat> which is governed by the Holy Spirit. And, and it's a big, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for a human to be governed by a holy God. But that's what we do. He shows, the last part, he shows that any faith, any faith which does not include both is not a genuine faith. Any faith that does not encourage spiritual growth and social interaction is not a genuine faith. Faith. I like it. Coin that term. Faith. Faith. I like it. Questions or comments? No introduction. Well, I heard somebody say the other day that not all believers are born in the rapture. Really? It goes back to genuine, doesn't it? It goes back to genuine, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, know, I know there will be those who are saved in the tribulation. I mean, we, we read about some that will be saved. But, uh, well, it, if you talk about, you know, there is such a thing as an unsaved believer. I was one. I was an unsaved believer. Ken Lewis said there's no such thing. Well, I knew where he's coming from, but I was. Well, listen, that was a lay minister. I mean, they were Christians in my life growing up. I've seen it around town. I've seen the other side, too. That's what the book's about. I always called them church people. It was a long time before I developed the term Christianity. That's a fancy word. I just called them church people. I know a lot of church people. There were a lot of people who wouldn't church people too. You know why? But I never had any doubt about the gospel. I never doubted that Jesus lived. I never doubted that he went to the cross. 
I, I never doubted that he died for sins. I, I never doubted anything that the Bible had, had to say about that. I didn't doubt that. But I wasn't saved. I, I had never been born again. I had never asked him to come into my heart. And for years and years and years, it was a head saved. It, it was an intellectual type of knowledge. I had known about it. <clears throat> Until that day in the field there, about where Don Scott is. That's about what happened, Don. You better be careful. That's about where it was. But I sat somewhere right in there. And Pastor Focus said, everybody stand. <clears throat> he was giving the altar call. I can't even tell you what he preached on that day. Uh, the only thing I remember is what he said in the altar call, Pastor. And, and he said, you may be here today. And you may be a good moral person, and you may be a good community person. And Linda can tell you at that time that I was involved in 10 things that I was doing community wise. Well, that was in the year of BK before we had kids. <laughs> that was about 10 BK. But anyway, <clears throat> that was it rescue, fire, dive team, teaching EMS, Army Reserve. I had a whole list of stuff I was doing. So he said, you may be here and you may be doing the end of <laughs> You may be a community person doing all that. But he said, that will not save you. Well, I had never really thought about that since. I would guess that probably I was thinking, you know, that maybe subconsciously or something. But anyway... <clears throat> So he said, I'm going to do something here I have never done before. And he told me, when I, I ended up being his associate pastor, if, if you can believe that, I ended up being his associate pastor. And he told me many times, he said, that's the first time I had ever done that. First time. And he'd been preaching for years. And he said, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. And if you will pray this prayer with me, Christ will come into your heart and save you. <clears throat> and before he started, my thought was, do I need to be saved? I mean, that was my thought. And good old Holy Spirit, me and him still laugh about that. You know, not really. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, well, why do you think you need to be? Now, who could have said that? Because there's nobody know what I was thinking. See, I asked the question, do I need to be saved? And the Holy Spirit said, why do you think you need to be? And I thought, ooh, ooh. if I ask the question, then I probably need to be. That's why you hear me say, if you're saved, you know it. <clears throat> you don't need anybody to tell you, you know it. Holy Spirit will confirm it. So when he prayed, I prayed. And I said, Lord, come into my heart and save me because I, I want to be saved. I mean, I do didn't tell a soul for three weeks. Didn't even tell me why. Never told anybody for three weeks. <clears throat> now, I was a closet Christian. <laughs> yeah, the rapture had come here now to wait because he was in my heart, see. <clears throat> but I didn't tell anybody. I didn't profess. I didn't know. It wasn't like I was ashamed of it or anything. I just didn't do that. You know, one day at work, <clears throat> one day at work, I asked him. I said, <clears throat> How do you know that Christ is really coming into your heart when you do that? And oh, can't wait to pencil down. He grinned real big and he said, You got saved. <laughs> I said, I didn't say I got saved. He's the one who invited me to church that Sunday, Pastor. And I said, I didn't say I got saved. He said, Oh, yeah. He said, I, I've seen a change in you. He said, I've seen your countenance change. I've seen, I've seen a change in you. He said, I have. I, I know. You got saved, and I thought I said, "Well, I did pray the prayer." I got he said, "Well, that's what it is. That's what it's about." <clears throat> and he began, he began teaching, you know, things. Can't, can't do it. Well, the next Sunday I went to the altar. <clears throat> you know, that, that's when I, and then I ended up getting baptized and going the whole nine yard. But the whole point, to answer your question, there is, see, I'll tell you how to make a watch. You can ask me what time it is. But to answer your question, there, there might be believers. Left who are not born again. They, they may believe it, but they're not born again. That, that, that's a possibility, I, I would suppose. I, I mean, I couldn't say no, 
that I believe that the born again Christians will go when Christ comes. Because I read in Revelation that he sends witnesses back. There is none left here, but he sends witnesses back. So, so I, I guess. Anybody else? There you go. Talk about true Christians. Oh. Amen. That, that change is, is the evidence. It, it's that evidence of, of Christ taking over that human character. It is. He's talking about the rapture, I think, there. In uh, 15. Uh, yeah. First Corinthians 15. Yeah. I'll, I, I believe everybody that's born again will be changed. Yeah. I do. I believe that. But as far as a believer, if the person is referring to a believer as somebody born again, no, I don't believe any born again people is going to be left behind. But unsaved people will be left behind. And, and if they have a head knowledge of this book in their head, and they believe it in their head, but he's not in their heart, I guess they'd fit that category if they weren't born again. That's what they tell us, God. They'll know him. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. You know, Sister Hazel also, not to hold you all night, you need to go and go, but Sister Hazel also always wrestled with the, with the scriptures where, where that Jesus would told the ones on the right side, you know, enter in. And he told the ones on the left side, and they said, but Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And Sister Hazel would say, how could they have done that? How could they have done that and not be in Christ? But the answer is, Jesus said, depart from me because I never knew you. Yeah. So that they knew him. Well, the name of Jesus is powerful. I mean, the demons have to listen to Jesus. You remember when the seven sons of Sceva went to cast out that demon? It got whooped, as we say it now. They got whooped. <clears throat> and they said, We adjure you in the name of Paul's Jesus. Wouldn't you like to be able to fly on the wall? <laughs> when that dude said, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But who are you? You know what I picture? I picture this great big giant guy with muscles and bulging out all over, and this little skinny guy standing there holding a stick. He <laughs> said, But who are you? Whoop them, strip them, and run them all. So he didn't, he wouldn't worry about who that guy was. But yeah, faith, faith. Anybody else? Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here. I thank you that we're patient with them. Lord, I, I just thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'd never be able to stand here and do the things I do were not for you. And, and I thank you for your grace and I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you, Lord, that you're a generous God and a gracious God. But I know you're also a God of judgment. And you listen to what we say and to how we say it and to who we deal with and Father, when it comes to your word, we want to be in your word. And Brother Jack says, we want to be in your will, but we don't want to be in your way. <clears throat> but we want you to use us to do what we need to do. Because we realize that this society is not going to get any better. We realize that every day things are changing and happening in our world that, that are pointing to your return. And Lord, we, we feel that we're ready to go because you're in our hearts. We know we're ready to go. But there's many that we know, even in our families, who are not ready should you come. So help us not only to be good disciples, but to be good evangelists. And to tell others about you so they too can come to know you as we know you. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise and the glory for it. In the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. And the saints will say, Bloody Lord. Amen. 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 Let me throw this tidbit out to you. How many seen the riots going on in Israel right now? Uh -huh. <clears throat> You've been seeing that on the news? Yeah. 
Have you dug into that to see really what the riots are about? Mm -hmm. You really got behind the scenes. Here's what's happening. Their Supreme Court, <clears throat> the Supreme Court of, of Israel, is elected by the people, the, what we would call the justices. Right now, in their current system, they're elected by the people of Israel. Well, Netanyahu wants to change that. He, he's in the hospital with heart issues. But he has legislation that he's been working on for years, for about five years. He wants to change that to where the, the court justices are appointed by the government, just like ours are. He wants to change it to that. And the people, number one, don't want that to happen. And then secondly, the rabbinical council, the council of rabbis, whom the Bible calls the Sanhedrin. Remember them? They're still a council. And the council of rabbis, they also have a proposal for legislation. Listen, they're wanting <coughs> To, to be appointed. They're, they're wanting to be a, given authority and to be appointed that they can apply religious laws to civil laws. See? Now, see, in this country, we're separated from church and state. Well, they are, kind of. But you still got the council, you still got the Jews, you still got the Orthodox Jews that follow the religious law. Now they, they also have a proposal in that legislation that they want to be, have authority, or they want to be able to apply religious law, now that's their law, to civil law. What's that tell you? Let me tell you what's going to happen in the tribulation. When Christ takes his church out, the Jews are going to take over. They're going to take over. They're, they're going to reestablish the old sacrificial system. We studied that in Revelation. Yeah. And those seven years are going to be under that Jewish rule. Yeah. So if if they're running things, whose law do you think they're going to go by? Their law. So if they're wanting to do that now. Huh? That, that, that tells <laughs> it's, it's, me that tells me that the rapture is closer than we ever know. It's winding, it's winding back. That may go on another year, another ten years, a thousand years, or he might come tonight. He could. Absolutely. But these things that are happening are things that will be going on during the tribulation. And seven years is really a short period of time when you think about it. Seven years is not enough time to get all this stuff worked out. It's going to be worked out so that when the church is gone, they just step right up and things are going to go on as usual. Just thought I'd throw that out there too. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and dig into that a little bit. Find out about that. You'll see it. I always, I always wonder what to do when they're protesting. Something's 